welcome you this morning. It was good uh, worshiping the Lord. I love this set, by the way. Man. Uh, you should have found um, at your uh, seat one of these prayer cards. Uh, on behalf of myself and the team going to Uganda, West Africa, uh, we want to um, ask for your prayers. All right? Uh, we'll be leaving uh, this Thursday, uh, 7.30 from RDU Airport, flying up to JFK. JFK uh, over to Accra, Ghana, and be over there for 16 days uh, ministering and uh, to uh, children, children of Fibashev uh, Training Center, um, severely handicapped boys and girls as we minister to them. You'll see us with our team shirts here. Our theme is based on Psalm 139, divinely designed. As we share with those children, there's no mistakes as far as God is concerned. Each one of us receive life from him, and that life has a purpose. God knows us, God sees us, and God loves us. And we want to share that with the boys and girls there that face really uh, severe challenges uh, in their life. And then we'll be ministering the thousands of boys and girls in that area. So we are going to need your prayers, especially your prayers. There's a lot of hoops to go through in order to get on the plane, in order to get there, all right? So if you would just pray for that. So keep that card. Remember us uh, in prayer. Also, I want to say, uh, as you're turning in your Bibles to Psalm 139, because that's what I'm going to speak a little bit on this morning before Pastor Matt comes and uh, commissions the team, I want to thank you as a church from the bottom of my heart for your support uh, for this ministry uh, to Ghana. Uh, through your gifts, been able to buy much-needed supplies that were taken over there. I think most of us see and understand the situation going on in the world. Uh, inflation is taking hold. Prices have increased. And when you go to third-world countries, uh, when their food prices increase 25%, uh, for them that's a severe, severe uh, hardship to be able to have enough food uh, to be able to you know, buy enough food to have one or two meals uh, a day. So... I want to say thank you, because this church, uh, Pastor Matt, has been very, very generous, and uh, God notes that, and you, I, I cannot say enough about that. Thank you again from the bottom of my heart. But Psalm 139, this is a message that, I'm, that God gave me that I'm going to share over in Ghana, so I thought, perfect message uh, to give you. In fact, uh, the trip that we are doing now and the program that we're going to do, we what we're um, intending to do a year ago, but because of COVID, weren't able to do it. So we're going there this year uh, with this theme. So I've had this message in mind for quite a while, right? Psalm 139. Um, understand, you know, when you look around, and I've said this before, in the situation going on in our world, it seems to be that uh, many are turning away from God. The percentage of people going to church seems to be on the decline. The people adhering, uh, adhering to uh, biblical values or beliefs seems to be on the decline. And uh, believers who are faithful, I mean, we're here in church, ask themselves, well, what can I do in the midst of the culture and society that I find myself? And really, if you understand what the verses I'm going to preach on this morning, the question or the answer is that before we do anything, we need to be something, all right? Sometimes we concentrate, and I'm, I'm good at this, all right? I'm going to do something. But before you can do anything that's spiritually effective for God, you need to be the man or woman that God intends you to be. So and unless we uh, uh, are who we need to be, it won't matter personally what we do, all right? You can stay busy all you want. But unless you have allowed God to take hold of your life and shape you into the man or woman God would have you to be, all that work is going to be futile. Now, keeping that in mind, Psalm 139. All right, a little bit of background because I'm going to really preach on the last two verses of Psalm 139. Most of our program is all going to be based on the beginning of Psalm 139 where it talks about that God has searched my heart. God knows me. Uh, there's nowhere I can escape from God. God loves me. But um, you'll see in the end of that uh, chapter... Uh, David uh, utters up a plea, utters up a prayer, and that's what we're going to look at. 
A little bit about the background before I read those verses. David is in the midst of this time in his life in a very dangerous national situation. The kingdom is being torn by internal strife. Uh, slave uh, hated master. Master hated slave. The people blamed the government. The government blamed the people. It sounds very familiar, right? It's like the nation stood on the brink, all right, of civil war. And David knew that if things didn't change quickly, the nation was going to collapse, all right? David believed this in his heart, that the nation's sickness, what was going on in the nation, was directly attributed to his spiritual condition, the ills in the people spiritually. And he knew if it wasn't addressed, uh, economic depression, moral disintegration, military defeat are eventually going to follow. All right, eventually follow a spiritual decline. Therefore, David falls to his knees at these last two verses and turns to God. Because this is what he believes. This is his mindset. He believes that the spiritual tide of the nation over which he is king could rise no higher than the spiritual level of his own heart. He couldn't pray for the people to be something that he was not. See, we're kind of prone to this a lot, at least me, is that I know what you should be, but uh, I first need to look at my life and make sure that I am who I should be before I look to you and tell you what you need to be. And uh, he believes this, that the spiritual tide of the people, all right, no, going to rise no higher than his own. So this is the prayer that he prays, very simple prayer. All right, Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. He has said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, as we look, dear Lord, at these verses, the prayer that David uttered so many years ago, dear Lord, that that would be our prayer, that would be our plea, that would be our desire, that you would search our hearts, that you would look into our thoughts, our anxieties, that you would search our lives for any hidden sin, dear Lord, that you would lead us in the way that is everlasting, the way that is pleasing to you. So dear Lord, use your word this morning to do a work in our hearts. For I pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. I want to give you three simple truths, all right? The first one, I want you to look at what David is asking, the plea, all right, David voiced. He says, search me, O God. See, my tendency, all right, is not so much to search me, but to search you. I can come alongside you after a while, and I'll tell you everything that's wrong with you. I'll tell you what you need to do in your life, what you need to correct. Aren't we all prone to this, right? I mean, the kids look to their parents, all right? This is where you need to, you know, straighten up. We look to the kids, well, this is where you need to be. I mean, we do this, all right? David is saying, no, don't search the people of the nation. I want you to search me. That's what he's asking God. David is inviting God to scrutinize his life. See, David knew that if revival is to come to the nation, the people are to turn back to God, then it has to begin with him. Now, David as a king, he knew what it was like, all right, to have traitors in his midst, all right? And David is asking, is there any area in my life in which I am a traitor to God? That I have walked back in my allegiance to my Lord. Now, that's kind of a bold request, if you think for a second. Because David might not like what is revealed. But David wants to be under no delusion, no self-deception. See, we have the tendency, we give ourselves a pass, right? But David said, I don't want any pass. I want you to look in my life. I want you to be honest with me. I want you to search me. In fact, if you're reading these verses in the Hebrew, almost every verb in those verses is an imperative. And what that means, he's calling on God in the strongest terms possible to look deep within his being to find anything, all right, that uh, would keep his heart from being in intimacy with God. Now, if you remember the Old Testament, all right, sacrificial system, 
when they would take the lamb to the altar, the lamb had to be without blemish. Am I right? They looked at the lamb on the outside, making sure there was no deformity. He says, I don't want that. He says, I want you to look deep in me. See, it's easy, and we learn this as you get a little bit older, we can look good on the outside and it not be what the reality is on the inside. And David says, I don't care what other people think about me. I don't really care what other people know about me. I want you to look into my heart, and I want you, all right, to search me. And David wants it to be a thorough search. In fact, the Hebrew word he uses when he said, Lord, search my heart, is a reference to boring down deep within the earth, all right, for precious metals or water, like you would see, you know, the drills, the drill well in this area, or if you're going to go in mining. And David is saying, I want you to drill down deep into my life, all right? I don't want no surface thing, all right, saying, you're, you're a good guy, David. I mean, you're, you're fine. No, I want you to look deep down. David is inviting God to look into every corner of his life. David's plea is kind of similar to another man by the name of Job. If you remember this in Job 31, 6 and 7, when Job said, Let me be weighed on honest scales, that God may know my integrity if my steps have turned any way apart from your path. This is what David's asking. And this is what we need to ask. All right? Our tendency is to ask people who are going to say, the, agree with us, right? Say good things about us. But David's saying, I want, Lord, I want you to search my heart, to search my being, all right, to search me. Now, you'll notice the search that he requested. Three things he mentions, all right, in these verses. And the first thing, he says, search me, O God, and know my what? Know my heart, all right? The first area he wants God to search is his heart. Now, what did David mean? Now, David did not mean, you know, he, that, you know give me an echocardiogram, or, you know, MRI, or you know, EKG, to check out how everything is. See, the Hebrew, all right, heart means the innermost being of a human being, my true self, who I really am. David wants God to search his heart, the place where his emotions came from, the place where his desires would begin, and the place that drove him for every act he did in his life. I want you to search what makes me really tick, all right? The way I think, the way I act, the way I speak. I want you to search my heart. David knew that man's tendency is to rationalize, all right, his actions, who he is. And David doesn't want his own heart to trick him. In Job 31, Job asked God to weigh him and to see if his heart walked after his eyes, all right? He said, I want you to search me that I may know my heart, that you may know my heart. David's asking the same thing. Has my heart turned away from God in any way? You know, a lot of us, we think, well, I know my heart. I know who I am. I know myself, all right? Um, I, you know, I know my motives, know why I do what I do, tell them themselves, you know, I'm, I'm basically a good person. Well, I'm at least as good as the person sitting next to me or the person I work with. I have a good heart. But David, when he's asking this, what he is saying, I don't trust myself. All right? He says, my tendency is going to be to give me a pass. All right? David does not trust himself because he knew, and you read this in the Psalms, man's heart is corrupt. All right? So at the core, David understood my heart is really not about God. My heart's about Bill Haggadus, all right? And David knew this. It's not really at the core about what is eternal, but my heart is really concerned about what is, what? Here in this flesh at this time, what is temporary, my comfort. Uh, it's obsessed with what we want, not what God wants. So David said, you need to examine my heart. I need to know what my heart is. David wants his heart searched and revealed. We need to be able to ask God that. I want, I want to know really my heart. What makes me tick? Why the emotions that I have? Why I say what I say? Why I'm triggered to do what I do? 
I want you to search my heart, O oh God, and I want you to put it right before me and be honest with me. But not only search my heart, he says, I want you, what does he say, try me and know my anxieties. This is the same request that he wrote in Psalm 26, verse 2, when he said, examine me, O Lord, and prove me, and try my mind, know my mind. David wants to know what occupies his very thoughts, the fears, the anxieties, what crosses his mind that keeps him from fully knowing God, all right? See, now, why don't you follow what he's asking? See, the Lord already knows. If you read a little bit earlier in Psalm 139, he knows what occupies our mind. He knows our thoughts. He knows what occupies our mind. Psalm 139, verse 2, you know my every thought even when I'm far away. All right, so David wrote, you know my thoughts. In other words, every, I mean, that's enough to make you sit up, all right, and saying everything that crosses my brain, God knows, all right? So what's he asking for here? He's saying, examine my thoughts, but yet he says, God knows my thoughts, all right? What is he praying for? To know that, you need to understand the Hebrew word that he uses, all right? The word that he uses for thought or anxiety means branches. Now, if you know that, then what's he talking about, all right? He's talking about this. I don't want to just know what crosses my brain, my thoughts, what I'm dwelling on. I want to know because of those thoughts, what are the branches going out, how that it affects my life. See, your thought life, what you think on, what you dwell on, affects your attitude, affects your actions, affects your words, affects how you live your life. And David says, I want you to show me not only my thoughts, but I want you to show me the repercussions of those thoughts. I want my thought life to be right. And that's what he's praying. He wants to know the ramifications of his thoughts. He wants to know what, what happens because if I give in to fear all my life, how is it affecting my life? Is my thought life, he's asking, driving me closer to God or driving me further away from God? Good question to ask ourselves. Am I right? What thoughts, what fears are holding you hostage, keeping you from being the man or woman of God that he would have you to be? Thoughts that refuse to be quieted. I, mean, I, I know them, and I'm sure. I'm, I'm getting ready to go to Ghana, and I'm constantly battling these thoughts. It's like I'm packing my, my suitcase, right? I think half of it's medicine. What happens if my knee goes out, my back goes out? What happens if I need Pepto? I make it better take some modium D. I mean, I mean, I got so much. I'm going to open a Walgreens over there, all right? But we all have anxieties, don't we? All right? And I got to ask myself, is what I dwell on is it driving me closer to God or further away from God, all right? Thoughts that refuse to be quieted, thoughts that are killing your faith, that are taking you away from God, questioning everything, your health. You know, you have thoughts about that, and well, what happens if I lose a job? What happens if I get COVID, you know? I mean, it's like I was, I was kidding around with somebody, you know, and I'm not telling you pro or negative uh, vaccines. I was seeing on Facebook, you see the, what was it, uh, Men in Black 1, right, that one alien guy that was, you know, like, like that, and it was showing his picture. He was in for his 69th booster shot, right? I go, oh, man. You know, people look at that, and they get away worried, right? What's going to happen? Can I trust anybody? I'm saying your thought life matters. What you dwell on is going to take you further from God or closer to God. And David said, I want to know what's happening all right, in my life. David wanted to face his fears, wanted to face his destructive thoughts so he could trust God fully. And here's the question to ask. I wrote down, where do you trust God the least? Money? Health? Job? Where is you trust the least? Your fears reveal how you're relying on self, not God. They show where you need to grow with God. All right? David knew, he says, I want you to examine not only my heart, who I am, I want you to examine my thoughts, the ramifications of them, where they're taking me. 
You'll never trust God fully or know God fully until you turn all your fears over to him. Realize the fact, you know, hey, you can be afraid all you want, but um, you were never enough. You were always weak, and you only can trust on him. The only security is in God. You understand that, right? And um, David understood that. He said, I want you to know my thoughts. But not only heart thoughts, but what did he say? He says, see if there be any what? Wicked way in me. All right? Here's David. David was a man after God's own heart, right? Now, of course, we know that the great sin he committed, but David understood you can be a man after God's own heart, but that does not mean you're free of sin. You understand there's not one of us here that's free of sin, right? There's nobody that's going to come to this pulpit and say, you know what? Let me share with you all. I found the secret. How I can get through a day never sinning, no omission, commission, thoughts or anything. No, we're all in the same boat. Am I right? I, I, I think I've shared before when I was a young Christian, I would listen to these preachers. I heard them telling me, you know, I, no, I, you know I, I've, I've made it. I, I don't deal with that sin or this sin. And I would sit there as a young guy, you know, like 19 years of age. I'm like, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> All right. Man, my thoughts and things. I mean, I, I mean, something's dead wrong. All right. Until I realized, you know, and, and this is true in my life, that one of those guys ran away with the secretary, and I realized, oh, guess what? He was lying. All right. <laughs> it's like we all battle with. Some of us are very good at covering it, right? How are you doing? I'm doing fine, right? I Man, I'm trusting the Lord. David doesn't want that. He wants his sin searched out. You know what I think of this? I think of, of the Feast of Passover. When I lived in northeast New Jersey, a lot of Jewish people in that area, and I had people in my congregation that would work for Jewish people, Jewish believers, all right? And uh, when they celebrate Passover, for Passover, seven days you were not to eat what? Test your leaven, right? Because leaven is a symbol of sin. When Israel, all right, left, all right, uh, Egypt, remember they weren't able to leaven their bread, they ate unleavened bread. And what they would do, I still remember a friend of mine, Frank Puglisi, who was a contractor, all right, the rabbi would hire him to come into his house and literally would go in every cupboard, take all the canned goods, everything out, looking for a crumb. You understand, at Passover, they would examine their pockets in their coats and everything to find a crumb you know if you had a cracker that you put in there you know years before or whatever that searched everywhere that there was not a crumb of leaven anywhere in the house you know this is what Dave is asking he's not saying I, I don't want to know the biggies I understand that all right I want you to search if there's anything in my life the smallest crumb that keeps me from knowing you, that I would give myself a pass. See, David knew otherwise. He knew there's no one that was sin-free. In fact, uh, again, Psalm 19, verse 12, he says, who can discern their own errors? Who, in other words, who can examine themselves, right? Like, you ever do this physically? When you become old, you, really, you, you don't understand what I'm saying. You go on Facebook, and they have every disease, you know, that comes up. If you ache here, here, and here, you have this cancer. Ache here, here, and there, you have this. And you're older, you start going, do I got that? I mean, am, am I right? You examine yourself. David says, who? And, you know, you come up with these diagnoses, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor looks at you. <laughs> yeah. And he thinks you're crazy, right? And I'm, he, this is what David's saying. You can't diagnose yourself. You need somebody else to have an honest look at you. Then he says, Forgive my hidden faults. I got stuff that's hidden that I give a pass. I, I still remember the story of a missionary, and this kind of fits in with what we're going through today. Dr. A. McLaurin, he was the missionary in India years ago, a plague in uh, India. And the back country, all right, uh, and you still see this today, people were leery of all the health officials. They didn't trust them, all right? And it ended up that in India at that time, people died from this plague, and they would bring the death carts through, and they would put the corpses into those carts of dead bodies, and they would take them away. But what many of the people would do when they saw the death cart coming, they would hide the dead bodies of their family behind a curtain in the back, all right, of their hut or the back of their, their, their dwelling. And they would come, do you have any dead? Oh, I have no dead here. 
and the corpses remain there to what? Poison the whole house, all right? And our tendency is what? Sin, we just hide it in the bag. I'm good. There's nothing here. I mean, I'm fine, all right? David says, nope, I know I'm. Really, David's saying, I know I'm not fine, <laughs> all right? I know there's things in my life that I am not even aware of that are keeping me from fully knowing you, and I want to know. And the word David uses for a wicked way or offensive is a way of idolatry. Any defection from God or his word. God, uh, David wants God to show him if he's doing anything that offends God's heart. David doesn't want anything hidden. And understand God's desire for you and I is to walk in the path of God's word. Read Psalm 119. He knows this is the only way of blessing as we walk in obedience to his word. Problem today, we have a lot of people who want to believe, but yet don't want to obey. It's impossible. All right? True faith manifests itself in obedience to their Lord. All right? And David is saying, I want to choose the path of God's word. That's why Psalm 119, 30, I have chosen the way of truth. Your word have I laid before me. And uh, we need to make that choice. Now, I, I wrote down this. I'm going to give you this real quick. How do you discover what's offensive to God? All right? Uh, how does God reveal sin to us? Let me give you a quick number one. First, you consider what God's word says. All right? A standard of truth is not what other people think. The standard of truth is the word of God. You can think what you think. You can feel what you want to feel. But the standard of truth is the unchanging, inerrant word of God. One of the reasons we hide God's word in our heart is in order to know what? Sin. All right? Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But we have to consider what God's word says. All right? Second, you need to be open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, the Spirit of the living God comes to dwell within you. And see, now we have a way of rationalizing our sin. Am I right? Well, God knows the situation. I, I mean, I had people that would come to church, and they'd be in my office explaining to me, all right, a young man, a young man, how it was okay, and God gave them a pass of living together. And I'd be going, man, that's interesting, all right, is that we can make excuses for anything, all right? Because nobody wants to hear, you know, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is sin, right? That, that's the culture we're in today. Everybody wants to hear, God bless, that's your truth. You live in that, and that's one of them. No, that's like telling a person that's taking a bottle of strychnine, say, no, that's good for you. Just swallow it, I and you're going to, no. You have to be honest. The Holy Spirit of God, what he ends up doing, all right, he points out sin in our lives. That's why I say you can be a Christian in sin. The problem is you can't ever enjoy it anymore, all right? Because the Holy Spirit of God keeps on convicting you. Uh, Jesus, in John 16, verse 8, said this the night he was going to be betrayed and said, when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You know what that means? Well, think about it. I said all of us have sinned in our life. If you're telling me you can't even remember the last time the Holy Spirit convicted you of sin, something is wrong. Something is dead wrong. All right? Because the closer you draw to God, the more sin is exposed in our life. So either you're saying you have no sin whatsoever or you have backed away from the light. All right? So we listen to the Holy Spirit. Third, consider what other people tell you especially if more than two. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. All of us need to have mature believers in our life that will sit down and be honest with us. I mean, that literally you can be able to go to them. Would you tell me how I'm doing? See, a lot of us, again, we don't want that because you don't want to hear it. But we need to have that. And fourth, don't waste your pain. Sometimes God allows pain in our life, all right, to point out sin. Psalm 119, 71, it's good for me, David said, that I've been afflicted, that I may learn your way. Psalm 119, 75, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. 
Not all pain is from God. But God is able to take even that which is a negative, use it for a positive, all right, in your life and in my life. And what I'm saying, David is saying, I want you to search my heart. I want you to search my anxieties, my thoughts, where they're leading me. And I want you to search out sin. The last thing I would say, what's the reason he's praying this? Look at the last phrase of that prayer. He says, you lead me in what? The way everlasting. Understand, David's desire is not just for God to show him how impure he is, how wicked his thoughts can be, all right, how offensive maybe is the God. David ultimately wants God to guide him to be the man of God that God wants him to be. That's what this is all about. I want to be a man of God that leads your nation. Before I can call a nation to repentance, I need to be the person that I should be. And you notice what he admits for that to happen. What does he say? He says, lead me. All right? David knows he can't do it on his own. He is saying, God, you need to search me, and then you lead me. David understands to be the man of God, he needs God's wisdom, God's knowledge, what's in his life, and then he needs God's strength to walk in light of what's revealed in his life. And you notice what he wants to be led in. He wants to be led in the way what? What does it say there? The way everlasting. That Hebrew literally means the old paths. The way our forefathers traveled. All right? The way that we find rest for our souls. The way of godliness. The perpetual way. The everlasting way. He's talking about the way that true blessing comes. You know, the first psalm was Psalm 1. This is what David had in mind. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in due season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. You know what David's praying? Lead me in the way of righteousness. Lead me in your way. I want to go in that way. I want to be that man that can lead our nation all right back to you. And the um, question that comes for us as believers, will I be like David? Am I willing to understand, you know, before I do anything, you know, am I going to ask God to search my life, my heart, my thoughts, my sin, and to really want to be the man or woman that God wants me to be? See, without this, you or I, we're not going to touch our families. We're not going to touch a nation. We're not going to touch people next to us. We have to start with what David realized, all right? We start with ourselves. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I really don't know your heart, and I don't know your thoughts. I don't know hidden sins. It's the same way you don't know me that way. But God knows. Now the question is, do you want God to reveal that to you? That he can lead you in the way everlasting. That you can be the man, woman, young person that God would have you to be. Maybe this morning we're going to have a verse of invitation. We do this each Sunday. It's good to respond to the word of God as God speaks to you. Maybe you need to go to this altar and pray that simple prayer that David prayed. Lord, I want you to search my heart. I want you to search my anxieties, my thoughts, and I want you to reveal any hidden sin in my life that keeps me from knowing you fully. Greatest act of worship you could do this morning is to fall on your knees and ask him to do that. And then he's able to take your life and to use you to touch your family, your neighborhood, nation, and who knows what else. I'm going to ask if we could all stand. 
everyone standing, heads bowed, eyes closed. Jason and the band will end up singing the verse of invitation of God has spoken to you, and that's your prayer. You want to pray the prayer that David prayed so many years ago. We invite you to come to the altar at this time. I'm going to ask the members of uh, the Ghana team that are here this morning if you would uh, come up and maybe just stand right on this first step right here. Uh, Pastor Matt's going to come and commission the team uh, at this time. I might say some of our folks from the church are not here because, um, uh, again, with other things, uh, you'll see that Mimi Holland's not here. She is uh, at a swim meet uh, down South Carolina. Uh, Kevin is not here. Uh, remember uh, him in prayer. And then the other members of the team will uh, be coming in from Charlotte and then some meeting us up uh, in New Jersey. Today is an exciting day because if you've never seen a commissioning or you've never been a part of it, maybe you're not even familiar with what that word actually means. But the word commission literally means a sending forth, a sending out. And there is nothing more exciting to be known as a sending church, one who sends out those who share the good news of Jesus Christ. So today we are literally sending out as God has called them. We as the local church have the authority to commission these missionaries, okay? So we are actually granting them the authority and the blessing, allowing them to act and minister on behalf of this body, all right? So that's why it's important. That is why we do it. Today we are commissioning these missionaries to go for him to share his name, his fame, his good news, his gospel. And we see this all throughout the gospels. All the way over in Matthew, we see the famous Great Commission. Jesus says, go and make disciples. We see it in Mark. Jesus calls us to go, tell the good news to everyone, everywhere in chapter 16. All the way over in Luke, Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit to be with us as we share his good news. And even in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. And that is what we have come to do today, to send them out. So church, it is with great joy and humility that I present to you those who are going on our behalf. If you can't go, we can at least support those who are willing to go. And to our mission team, may I present to you the people who believe in you, who support you, who affirm your call for the gospel. So today as we commission our team, I have four questions I want to ask. Two are for the mission team, and two will be for the congregation. And if you earnestly and have a heartfelt response to say yes, will you simply respond loudly and clearly, we do, okay? So first, to our mission team. To our missionaries, we ask this. Do you accept your assignment as a commission from God to go and act on his behalf? We do. Do you accept the responsibility of representing this congregation in doing the work of our Lord Jesus in Ghana? We do. All right. And to the church, we read in the scriptures how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, those who share the gospel. So church, would you likewise respond, we do, with these questions? Will you earnestly agree and pray for their mission? Do you commit them now to the Lord's safekeeping? We do. And do you agree and recognize and support God's commission, God's call on their lives, and these participants to go in your name? We do. All right, members of the Ghana mission team, we're going to pray for you. I would love it if you would come and stand in front of the cross here at this altar. Church, I'm going to ask you guys to stand if you would. And we are going to pray for them. You don't have to come up and lay hands on them. I know some, some of you are still battling sniffles and different things. But if you would join your hearts... You can even reach your hand towards them. For this Ghana mission team, we send you out with excitement in the name of the Lord Jesus. With the blessing and support of this congregation, we are so excited. You have our prayers, encouragement, and support. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we commit to you this team. We send them out in your care. We affirm their commitment to follow you, to serve in your name. We trust that you would empower them. Let them be your hands and your feet. God, we pray that they would glorify you as they serve others. We ask that you would give each one of them courage and strength and patience, wisdom, stamina, endurance. Everything they would need, Lord, would you supply it according to your riches and glory. 
so they can be your witness to the world as they serve others. God, we thank you for these awesome missionaries who have taken very seriously your call to love you and love people. And we look so forward to hearing all the amazing things you are going to do through them. And so now, Lord, lastly, we ask for your safety to surround them. As they go, God, I pray that you would bring them back safely to us. And together in unity, we pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's children said, amen and amen. You are dismissed. Come around. If you feel comfortable, give them a hug. Let them know you're encouraged and you are praying for them as they serve in your name.